So that's going to be a great time of worship next week. Like Jason said, we're going to have baptism as well as Boris Golden. Uh, that will be flying in Saturday to come and do that presentation for us. I got to speak with him a couple of days ago, and he is really excited um, about being able to share with us. And this will be impactful for us, obviously. This would be impactful for someone that does not know Christ, uh, for maybe a Jewish friend um, that either is a Jewish friend that recognizes Jesus as the Messiah or someone that just has questions or is unsure. And so all of those would, would work out. Uh, and so I, I really urge you to think about someone that you could invite to be a part of this, but also to start preparing your heart. One of the reasons why I wanted to do this presentation this time of year is to really get us ready for Easter. And it's been on my heart, um, really starting about this time last year, that we set aside time and, and intentionally prepare our hearts to celebrate what Jesus did for us. Uh, the way we do life in America has set us up for failure in, in a number of ways, and one of them is that we just rush through everything. Um, and so when it comes to Easter, most of the time we're rushing to do family stuff, we're rushing to do church stuff, you got to get the Easter egg hunt in, you got to chase the Easter bunny down and tackle them and get the candy, and all of that stuff is going on. And for us as believers, if we're not careful, we will just rush through all of that stuff and go like, wow, that was a nice service, I had some delicious ham, whatever, and not really pause. And think about the fact that Jesus died for you because he loves you. He died for me because he loves me. And the hope of this world is the communication of that. Not a bunch of rules and, and laws and regulations, not, not buildings and all of that stuff. It's communicating the hope that comes from knowing that Jesus loves you, he loves me, and he came to rescue us and call us home, not to condemn us, not to hurt us. Um, and, and so I want us to be still and remember those things. And so next week is the beginning of that. The next Sunday after that, which will be the 22nd, we are going to kick off uh, 20 days of prayer and fasting. I, I saw, I'm sorry, I meant to mention this last week and totally forgot about it, but we, we've talked about it the past couple of Wednesday nights with the crew that comes for, to worship on Wednesday. And I want us to use the 20 days leading up to the extravaganza as an opportunity for us to intentionally focus in on God and our relationship with God. And so the last couple of years, I've challenged you to 20 hours of prayer. And, and that was simply trying to get a number of 20 people that would pray for an hour a day for five days leading up to Easter. This year, we're expanding it to 20 days. And so if you will commit to this, I'm going to send you devotionals so that we'll be reading some things together. I'm going to encourage you to fast from something and then to... To try the best that you can with your schedule to give up something that permits you more time with God. So for, for me, I'm going to be giving up some lunches so that I can take lunch and be with God. And your schedule might be something different. But that, that's just what I want to do because I want to be able to block out an hour a day over that period and pray and read and seek God's face. And think about the cross and think about the empty tomb and how that permeates every aspect of my life. And so if you're willing to be a part of this, if you want to be a part of this, um, you can just cruise along and follow us. Because I'm going to post stuff every day on Facebook as an encouragement to you and to keep you going. But if you want some direct contact and some direct encouragement and prayer from me, I would love to know that you're committing to this time with me. And so if you will text me, email me, carrier pigeon, snail mail, whatever works for you, just let me know that you want to be a part of the 20 days of prayer. Then every day during this period, I'm going to pray for you by name, and I'm also going to send you some encouragement. The period will run from the 22nd of March up until... April the 10th. And I know it's going to be tough. But here's my encouragement to you. We talked about this a little bit on, on, on Wednesday night. Uh, when it comes to fitness, we understand that you've got to push a little bit harder. When it comes to excelling at work, we understand you've got to push a little bit harder. You want to get the top of your class in, in, in high school, college, whatever. You know you've got to push a little harder. When it comes to our relationship with God, we just intentionally just want to coast. It's just natural. Like, I, I confess Christ as Lord, I show up to church, and I'm good. But we're not, because if we're not reaching forward, we're going to slide back. And so if you're like, I don't think I can do 20 days. I don't think I can fast. I don't think I can pray for a half hour or an hour a day. Just, just know where you are and strive for a little bit better, and just jump in and commit. Even if you fail or fall short of what you want to accomplish during this, I promise you, it will enrich your relationship with God. 
I have a friend, a really good friend, who um, has challenged his church now for the last two years to commit to 30 days of prayer and fasting in January. And he, he, he was sharing with me the other day that every time they do this, someone is delivered from alcoholism. Every time they do this, someone walks away from pornography. Every time they do this, someone's heart is mended and a relationship comes back together. Because God works through his people when we seek him. And that's what I'm trying to set us up for. I truly believe 2020 is going to be a, a crucial year for us as a church in the direction that lies ahead. And, and that's not going to happen just because it's 2020. It's going to happen because we say, God, we pursue you with all our hearts in 2020. And then we're going to watch them do something. So if you want more information on that, please let me know. I would love to get you plugged in and engaged. And again, that's going to start next Sunday. So uh, figure out what works for you, how you can block out the time, and then let's do this together. All right, so again this morning, we are in Revelation chapter 12, and we're talking about war in heaven. I was thinking on the drive-in, it, it just popped into my mind as I was trying to think of uh, some things to equate this to, that, um, that we've now been at war as a country for so long that there are brand new soldiers who are enlisting that were not born when this war began. First time that's happened in the history of the United States. I know it's happened in our distant past in Europe and stuff like that. But in the U.S., it's the first time we've been at war, actively engaged in war so long that brand new soldiers were not born when we started this whole deal. But here's the thing about that. Like, it's been going on for a super long time, but if you, if you really think about it, it doesn't impact our lives here very much. Our gas price is a little bit higher? Probably. Are we paying a little bit more at the grocery store? Probably. But are we not getting gas? We're not getting food because of our, the impact of the war. Are we waking up in the morning? Are we fearful that we're going to be attacked? Are many of us who don't know soldiers actually thinking about their safety and praying for them? Probably not because life just goes on here. Uh, I was reading through our church history not too long ago, and back in the 40s during World War II, we had a fire in our old building, and they couldn't build for two years because of rationing. And they couldn't purchase the stuff to rebuild what had been burned because things were being rationed because everything was going towards the war effort because the world was at stake. We don't feel that way with the war in Afghanistan and everything else going in the Middle East. Like We catch it on the news and we're a little concerned about it. We want to know what the president's going to do. But on a daily basis, most of us are going, wow, we're at war. This is a big deal. We've got to be all in on this thing. And realistically, most of us respond that same way when it comes to the spiritual war we're in. We've been in a spiritual war since Genesis. Genesis tells us that after God created us, he set everything in place, that the enemy popped in. He walked into the garden. The enemy came face to face with the people of God. And ever since then, he's been trying to tear us away from God. We've been in active, dangerous, life-altering, eternity-bound war for thousands of years. But most of us get up every day, and we go to work, and we go to school, and we live our lives. And we do our relationship stuff, and we pursue higher education and advancement in our job, and we think about retirement, and we're not thinking about the fact that we're at war and how very, very much is at stake. As we go to Revelation 12 this morning, we're going to get a picture of what that conflict looks like on the spiritual side of things. And as we've done with other passages that we've looked at, I, I want us to look at that briefly. And, and understand what John's revealing to us through God's word. But then I want us to talk about the war. I want us to talk about the battle and how it is that, that we defeat the enemy. Or better said, how God defeats the enemy through us. So we're going to start Revelation chapter 12 verse 1 where it says this. A great sign appeared in heaven. Now. Understand this is a sign. So we've looked at other things and like rocks fell from heaven and we talked about that probably is going to happen. And we talked about the sun growing dark and the moon growing red. Like I believe those things are going to happen. I believe those literally are going to happen. We, we looked at locusts like creatures that are probably demons and I think that's really going to happen. I don't think that's figurative. But here he says a great sign appeared. And so I think we've got a little transition that in what we're going to read is not physically going to happen, but spiritually is going to happen. We're going to be introduced to a woman and a dragon. I don't think suddenly in the middle of the tribulation period there's going to be this woman who gives birth and a dragon that tries to eat it. Like this isn't Lord of the Rings. That's not going to happen. I think this is a picture in spiritual places of something that actually is already taking place. 
So he said, a great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and with a crown of twelve stars on her head, was pregnant, and she cried out in pain, was about to give birth. Hopefully some of that imagery at least is familiar to you. You might remember this young boy named Joseph, and Joseph had these dreams. And in his dream, the sun and the moon and the stars bowed down to him. And the reason that ticked off his family was because the family recognized he was talking about them. And so it's believed that this picture of this woman who is crowned with the sun and the moon under her and surrounded by stars, that that's a picture of the nation of Israel. So he's saying that Israel was about to have a son. But then there's another picture in verse 3. It says, another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns that swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment he was born. And so now we've got this dragon, and in a few verses we're going to be told specifically that the dragon is Satan. Like there's no question, there's no guess. He says, it's, it's the devil, it is Satan, it is, that guy it is the dragon. And the dragon's got horns and he's got heads, and those are symbols for knowledge and authority. He swept a third of the stars from the sky. And we know that angels can be pictured as stars in Revelation, and we know from the Old Testament that when Satan was flung out of heaven after his rebellion, he took a third of the angels with him. So we've got this picture of this war that is taking place. By the way, you don't have to adapt your nativity scene after reading this. Like the dragon isn't supposed to come in between the shepherds and the wise man. Right, that's not the idea. Remember, it's a picture. It's a sign. This is happening in heaven. He wants to devour the child. In verse 5 it says, So she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God in his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to the place prepared to her for her by God, where she would be taken care of for 1,260 days. Remember, we learned last week that that's three and a half years. So we think this is the second half of the tribulation where things are going to get really, really bad for Israel. Then war broke out in heaven. This is where we start this morning. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who was Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough in the very... And they lost their place in heaven. And the great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our Lord, our God, and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Here's where we're focusing this morning. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much to shrink back from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. Big stuff. I remember, um, you guys have heard part of this story before. But about nine months after I joined the Army National Guard, I went to officer candidate school. I, I wasn't sure what direction I wanted to go yet. And so I, I, it just seemed like I, I wanted to be an officer. I had that sense. And so I began to cross over, as we say now, to the dark side and, and become an officer. And uh, before going the route of chaplain, I started down this path. And so all officers except for like doctors and chaplains and, and lawyers, all, all get this same kind of training, and it's, and it's war-focused. It's focused on how do you lead troops into battle. It, it's focused on how do you dominate the enemy and protect the interests of the United States and all of that kind of stuff. And so as I'm going into that, I was learning a few key things. One is if you go to war, you go to war to win. Makes sense, right? I mean, you, you don't send everybody over there kind of hoping for a draw or maybe this thing will turn. Like you go to win. Now, what sets us apart from other nations is that we don't go do that to seize land and to seize property and resources. We do that to protect our allies. We do that to protect ourselves. We do that to bring bad guys to justice. But nonetheless, you don't play war gently. You go to win. And if you're going to win, you have to understand who your enemy is. 
You have to understand who it is that's coming against you because if you understand who your enemy is, then you can understand how your enemy thinks. You can understand how he acts. You can understand how he plans. You can understand what his resources are and all of that stuff. And so we have to learn our enemies and their tactics and all of those things. My point is that I want us to understand as a church that we're at war. And I want us to understand who the enemy is. Because here's the thing. As you sit here in this place, it's air-conditioned, it's comfortable, there's no one threatening your life at this moment. And so we all sit here without the fog of war. We say, well, of course I know who the enemy is. The enemy is Satan. He is the devil. He's coming against me. He tries to divide us. Like, we understand that. We get it, Pastor. But here's the problem is that we accept that here, but then you go home from here and your spouse says something to you that ticks you off and you turn to your spouse, both guns blazing, ready to take them out in this verbal battle because you just want to win. And we forget they're not the enemy. <coughs> or it comes to a decision that we're going to make here at the church and we're talking about colors and textures and, and who's going to get resources and all of those things and we go into those, co those conversations both guns blazing because we want to win. It's war, right? You don't play around with war. We establish that. And so you go in and you go to destroy and you go to overtake and you go to win but the problem is we're doing all of that to the wrong person. We're doing that to our family. We're doing that to our church. We're doing that in our community. When what we need to be doing is focusing those efforts on the enemy. Yet again, we have established that I can't turn pages and talk at the same time, so I finally found it. Where I wanted to take you to is Ephesians 6. We often go to Ephesians 6. You can go there with me if you would like. We often go there and we jump right into the discussion about the armor of God because it's just kind of a cool picture, right? We like, we like getting out that whole set that looks like a knight and we've got the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith. The sword of the spirit. Like, like we like those things. We like that imagery. But we often jump into that conversation and we focus on the illustration and we don't really look at the whole picture. And so if you back up to verse 10 in Ephesians 6, he says what we're talking about. He says, finally, brothers, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, here's the key. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against powers and rulers and authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. We are not supposed to be fighting each other. We're supposed to be fighting the enemy. And if we really understood the enemy, we would know that his tactic is to turn us towards each other and to divide us. So that we expend energy fighting each other, and it is really easy for him to mow us down. Actually, sometimes he doesn't even have to. Sometimes he can just kind of whoop and back up as we tear each other up. We forget that it's a spiritual battle. About four or five years ago, I was sitting at my desk uh, late in the afternoon, and I was very, very focused on what I was reading and what I was praying. And at that point, I had intentionally turned my desk away from the door because I was trying to block off distractions. People come in, they talk to the secretary, they talk to me. They have no idea they're the fifth person to interrupt me as I read the same paragraph. Like They just don't know. And so I was trying to limit uh, distractions a little bit by turning myself away from the door, closing the door, all those kinds of things. And, and so I was really focused on this day trying to study, and I hear this sound behind me. And I turn around to this very large deputy sheriff in full tactical gear. Standing like five feet behind me. Ellen was our secretary at the time. She had gone home for the day, so there was no guard at the door. And he just walked right on in and probably stood there for a while. Could have killed me if he wanted to. I finally made some noise, so I, I got his presence, turned around. I had a heart attack, got off the floor, cleaned up my vomit. And then we had a conversation. And he said, hey, I want you to know that there's some things going on in the community. He said, I know you got a preschool. I know you got lots of people here from your church. You guys are in and out during the day. You need to know that last night we executed a drug bust. If you want to walk outside with me, I'll show you the house. And so he walked me outside and he pointed the house to me. It's just right over there. This was years ago. They're gone. It's okay. Uh, but it was right over there. And then he said, and by the way, we're watching these two houses. And so you need to know this is going on in your community, and you guys need to watch out and be careful. And also, if you see stuff, please call us. 
So we talked for a few more minutes, and then I said, well, well tell me this. I said, we, we're, we want to be a community-minded church. We want to help here where we can. What can we do? What can we do? And he said, that's a great question, Pastor. He said, I'm a believer. And he said, he said, don't overthink it. If you want to have an impact in this community and help us do what we do, be the church. So all you got to do is be the church. The reason that is true is because it is a spiritual battle. You see, we win by every soul that is one to Christ. We win when we share his testimony. We win when we point people to him. It's not about going in with guns blazing. It's not about kicking in doors and wrestling bad guys to the ground. It is about a war that, as Paul wrote in Ephesians, takes place in spiritual places. Therefore, it has to be fought by spiritual means. And we've got to understand that that is between us and him through the power that God allows us, not with each other. I've said this so many times. It's, it's funny. I, in a way, I take it as a compliment. I know it's not meant bad, but I've said this so many times that, I, that I've literally scanned the audience as I've said this next thing, especially in small meetings like with, with our leadership team or whatever. Like I'll say this, and I'll see eyes roll. And, and, and I don't take offense at it because I, I know what it is. What they're, they're not disagreeing with me. They're saying, oh, we've heard this so many times. He's always harping on this because we still mess it up. But part of what he does to divide us is he gets us to fight over stupid things. And so I can promise you, like we're setting aside this 20 days of prayer, if not during that after, there will be conflict in our church. There will be conflict in your family because the enemy's going to show up and we're going to let him trick us into thinking the enemy is each other. What we do is work for him. Instead, Back in Revelation 12, verse 11, in this end time scenario, when all these horrible things are taking place that we've read about up till now, and when this war takes place in heaven, and Satan loses, and he's cast now out of heaven permanently to the earth. Now, if that doesn't make sense to you, basically what we think is that, that way back in the Old Testament, Satan was kicked out, but he had access back. One of the reasons we think that is because of what we just read where it says he's the accuser of our brother. Well, obviously, he's going before God in order to do that. And in Job, we get a picture of that. In Job 1 and 2, we get this behind-the-scenes picture of this conversation that begins with God and Satan. God says to Satan, hey, where have you been? What have you been doing? And Satan's basically like, hey, been walking around the earth seeing who I can mess up. And so God's like, okay, did you consider my servant Job? He's righteous. Actually, he's the most righteous person on the planet. Satan's response is, well, he's like that because you protect him. See, there's the lie. Do you see it in how he works? Job's not righteous. He's not a good guy. He's a good guy because you protect him. Remove your protection. He will curse you to your face. God says, okay, you're on. But we believe that that's a, a kind of picture of what Satan's been doing all this time. But when this battle takes place that we just read about, he's going to be probably kicked out for good, no longer allowed that kind of an access. So just think about what's going to happen here and how horrible it's going to be during that time. That last verse that we read, uh, verse 12, the end of it, it says, he's filled with fury as he's been kicked out of heaven to the earth because he knows his time is short. Satan knows the Bible better than we do. All this stuff we're studying in Revelation, like he knows it backwards and forwards. He knows what his destiny is, and he wants to work all the harder to mess us up if he can so how do we fight that? Do we like do more, uh, do we cast more demons out? Do we walk around sprinkling holy water? Do, 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 do we do some incantations and some chants? Do we, do we put special rocks around the church? No, we don't do that. We fight the battle in spiritual places because the battle takes place in spiritual places because it is a spiritual battle. And so in verse 11, he says, they, meaning the faithful to God during this period as Satan is hurled down and he brings all of his fury against the earth, they triumph by the blood of the Lamb. That's the battleground. We need to understand, first and foremost, even though I've used the language a little bit about us overcoming and us fighting the fight, the reality is Jesus already fought it and he won it. He won it on the cross forever. And in that moment, he defeated sin and the grave and death and despair and all of that stuff, including Satan. He's... He's done. He's done. Recently, um, I, was, I was doing some training with some soldiers. And so we decided one night we would go see that new movie, um, 1917. I don't want to 
mess too much of the storyline up for you in case you're going to watch it. But, but there's this enemy soldier in that movie who's badly wounded. And his last act is to kill one of the heroes. And then he dies. In, in essence, that's, that's the place that Satan is now because of the cross. Like he's been dealt a death blow. But he's still dangerous. And he's still powerful. And he still wants to take us out however he can. And we just need to understand that well enough that we don't play into his deal. Like my, my point in this conversation is not to have this conversation so that you, as we like to say, look for a demon under every rock or every chair or every deacon. Like that's not the point. The point is just that we would be aware of the fact that this war is going on so that we don't play into the enemy's hand. So here's the thing. The gospel is our hope. The gospel is the hope for broken people, and we get that. But, but here, let me, let me one-up that for you. The gospel is the hope for difficult people. So last Thursday, we went to a conference at Lakes Church called Sharper uh, Ministry Conference. And it, it, was, it was intentionally designed to take like all the major ministries with, within our church and, and to empower those leaders. And so we went to youth stuff. We went to, I went to pastor stuff and administration stuff. We had people in women's ministry, I think. We had people in a prayer session. Like all these different sessions were going on. Uh, there were eight of our people that were there getting, getting highly trained as much as we can to bring that back to you. Well, one of the things that came up in the sessions that I was in a couple of different times was this idea of ministry to difficult people. And, and that's one of the battlegrounds where we often lose to Satan because what happens is we have someone who's a difficult person in our life, and, and it, all joking aside, that could be your spouse. That could be your kids. That could be a friend. It could be me sometimes. It's definitely going to be you sometimes. Um, I didn't mean to say that like that. Like, okay, it's definitely me sometimes. It's definitely you sometimes. Like, like everybody can be difficult at some point. And one of the things that I've been trying to learn and grab hold of, because I don't like prickly people any more than you do, but sometimes we've got to remember that difficult people are difficult sometimes because they face trauma. And they carry those wounds, and that's what makes them difficult. It's like those times that you, you, you're you walking home, and you look over, and you see, like, the, the squirrel that fell out of the tree, and they're hurt, and you want to help them, but then they bite you. And they're not bad. They're hurt, and they don't trust you, and so they lash out. And sometimes that's where people live. And, and if we could just grab hold of this idea that, 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 that we've got nothing to lose, that we're called to love them, um, I think that when we finish this time in Revelation, I think that we're going to go into a series called Hard Things or Difficult Things. And it's going to be about the difficult things that God has called us to do. And if you just kind of camp out on this for a moment, I mean, you think about the things that he has said. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemy and pray for them. And be patient. Be kind. One of the greatest things that we can grab hold of is that we're called to love because we've been loved. And in 1 John 3 or 4, he says this is how we know what love is. That he loved us, and he loved us with the death of his son. Romans 5, he did that while we were his enemies. Like that's the standard that God has set for us, that we would love, that we would forgive, that we would grant grace to others, not based on them being worthy, but based on God's love and grace and mercy and forgiveness poured out on us. So on the way up to the stage, I had to come over and have a seat by my brother-in-law because I was going to steal his story this morning. So I wanted to get his permission to do that. Um, I offered him actually the chance to share it. And he's like, nah, that's okay. I'm good. <laughs> he's got that cool voice. You should talk about it. Like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, but, but we were sitting around talking as a family last night, and, and he was sharing this story that, that really impacted me. It impacted me so much, I can't remember the book, even though we Googled it earlier. What's the name of the book, Jake? Bait of Satan. Bait of Satan, thank you. So he was telling us about this class that he took where they went through this book called The Bait of Satan. And he said in it there's this story of the author of the book, Jim Bevere, I think is his name. Got that? John. John Bevere. Uh, Bait of Satan is the name of the book. You should definitely read it because it sounds amazing. Uh, so he was there to speak at this large church. And the pastor was taking him around, showing him the campus, all those kinds of things. And so they walked by the greeter team. And the pastor said, hey, I want you to remember that guy. And then they moved on. And they went and did some other things. And he came to a woman 
that was kind of standing over the corner. He said, hey, I want you to remember that woman. And then they carried on and did the whole tour. And then they went into his office and they sat down. And the guy begins to tell John his story. And he said, you know, all at once, God kind of wrecked me. Like my dad died. And then I was serving in this church and the pastor left. And it was heart wrenching because the pastor left with my wife. And then the church said, we want him to come back and be my pastor so you can't stay here. And so in like a six or eight year, uh, month, year period, something like that, he loses his dad, he loses his job, he loses his wife, completely wrecked. And God does some things in his life and he moves him and he starts, he gets, he gets into a place where he's preaching again and the church is flourishing. And he said, one day as I'm ministering, I think it was on a Sunday or something like that, he's like, I'm ministering. And this couple walks in that wants to meet with me. And, and they came in and they sat down in my office. And they wanted to ask my forgiveness. And he said, the couple that did that was my former pastor and my former wife. They're now married. And God has done a work in their heart. And they came into my church. And they wanted my forgiveness. He said, that was hard. God had wrecked me. And the object that was used to wreck me was sitting in my office saying, will you forgive me? And then he said to the author, he said, the reason I'm telling you this story is because the book you wrote, The Bait of Satan, the bait is unforgiveness. And he said, I read your book, thankfully, before that conversation took place in my office. And it radically changed me. And so I was able to extend forgiveness to God. And then he said, you want me to really turn things up a notch? The greeter that you met was the pastor. The woman you met was my wife. And she's on staff now. And he's my best friend. And that happened because I forgave. Christ has called us to difficult things. And here's one of those nuggets that just dropped on me. I think it was like late Friday night, late Thursday night or something like that. One of the things that we miss when we let our emotions take control and we want to fight the fight in the flesh is that that person that we're fighting with may only be able to see the gospel in our life. What if you're the only Jesus they see ever? That person that is rude to you at work, that person that you can't deal with um, on a daily basis, your job, that spouse, that child that just really drives you crazy. That one that's just really hard to work with. We've got some of our preschool teachers here. You guys have some kids that you work with in the preschool that are challenging. You have some parents probably that are also challenging. Uh, Jason, <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to let you wonder if I'm saying he's challenging or that he deals with challenging people. Uh, but we, we've all got it. Like I said earlier, sometimes you're the challenging person. Sometimes I'm the challenging person. And then there's Levi. That's the whole point of her son. We do love Levi. But how does it change things if we recognize we're in a spiritual battle? And we recognize that we're being attacked by a person who may be wounded. And then we realize that it could be that I'm called to be the gospel to them. We've got this scene in Revelation, this horrible battle that's going on. And we've read leading up to here things that are going to pale in comparison with the things that are yet to come. There's been chaos. There's been death. There's been a lot of pain. Everybody at this point, I, I can promise you, everybody at this point living on the earth is, is a little traumatized. To say the least. Like they've been through some stuff. The sky falling and the earth opening up and crazy creatures and lots of death and lots of pain and lots of hurting. And yet it says of God's people that during this time they overcame the enemy by the blood of the lamb. And they overcame the enemy by the word of their testimony. And something that I want us to understand about this is that, is that when we share our testimony, we're sharing his story, not ours. Now, of course, we're involved in it, and we're a character in it, but sometimes when we tell our story, it sounds like a self-help uh, overcome story. Like, I was wretched, and I was pitiful, and I was a sinner, and then I came to God, and look how amazing I am now. Instead of, 
I was wretched, I was pitiful, and I was a sinner, and God poured out his love on me, and this is how God's love has shown itself through me, and the amazing thing above amazing things is that I am still wretched, I am still pitiful, I am still horrible to my core, and yet God loves me, and he chose me, and he's using me for his glory. It's his story, not ours. I promise you, the more I grow, the more I grab hold of that, the less I am bothered by other people's sin, the more I am appalled at my own. There are some times, just to be honest, that I wrestle on Saturday night not to remember a story, not to understand a concept, not to think of an illustration. I wrestle with my unworthiness to proclaim God's love to you. And that's his story. Is that in spite of that, he chooses to use me. In spite of my shortcomings. In spite of my feelings. And I want you to know that. Not to understand how jacked up your pastor is. But to understand that if God can use me, he will most certainly use you. In the most horrible time in the earth's history. As God's wrath is poured out on the earth, and then Satan's wrath is poured out on the earth. God's going to overcome the darkness because the Savior, because Jesus gave his life. And then because God's people are going to stand up and tell that story over and over and over again. And they're going to tell that story in spite of the fact that it will cost them their life. Verse 12, it says, I'm sorry, verse 11, they triumph over him, meaning the enemy, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much to shrink back from death. That's. If you, if you think back to our first couple of conversations in the book of Revelation, we're going through the seven letters to the seven churches. We saw over and over again that they were persecuted and that they were dying for their faith. We talked about that's, that's not happening in American culture very, very often, hardly ever at all. Now, overseas, we see that happen. Uh, you read about Christians in Nigeria. You read about Christians in the Middle East. You read about Christians even, even in places in Europe where we know they're being persecuted for their faith. They are losing jobs. They're being thrown into jail. They are dying. Like that is happening around the world, but it is not happening here. But it's not all about death physically. The primary calling that Christ has given us is that when we come to him that we recognize it means death to self. You know, that is the only way you can forgive someone that's really hurt you and that I can forgive someone that's really hurt me is if I die to myself. If I let go of my right to be bitter so that I can extend grace to them. I've got to stop thinking that I'm God and I get to make that choice. I try to picture this scene sometimes when we're talking about it. And for, for, for anyone that wants to lead and lead well, part of the desire is to see the number of people that you lead grow. And yet it says of Jesus that when his crowds were growing, he looked at them and he didn't say things to encourage them and build them up in that moment. He, he kind of cut them down. Like, you know, if you want to follow me, you want to be my disciple, it's a calling to death. You need to pick up your cross, die to yourself, Every day to follow me. The temptation as a leader when you begin to draw a crowd is that hey, if you follow me, I'll take care of you. If you follow me, I'll provide for you. If you follow me, I'll make you safe. If you follow me, I'll encourage you. If you follow me, I'll love you. If I fo you follow me, I will give you good things. Jesus said, if you follow me, then you need to pick up the implement of your own death and you need to carry it so that every day you can die. Every day you can live in pain. Every day you can forsake comfort. Every day you can forsake self in order to strive after the kingdom, which is something that's far greater than any of us and actually has has eternal value to honor him forever. Again, you're probably not going to face someone who's going to threaten your life because you believe in Jesus. But I promise you that there is a spiritual battle that will rage in your life where the enemy 
I didn't really talk about it on that first slide, but did you catch where it said he's a liar and he's a counterfeiter? One of the things the enemy likes to do, loves to do, is to put something in front of us that kind of looks like what God would offer, but it's just slightly off. Think about that very first conversation in the garden. Excuse me, Adam and Eve are there, and they've been given very simple instructions. Hey, love each other, populate the earth, take care of the garden, don't eat from that tree. And they're given like three really simple things to do. And then we're told like the very next chapter is when Satan enters, chapter 3 of Genesis. He, he enters, and when he comes to Eve, he doesn't come right out and say, follow me to your destruction. He doesn't come out and say, I'm going to kill you. And he doesn't do the things that we would think of an evil master villain doing. He comes and he questions God first. Did God really say that? Did God really say that if you did this, this would happen? Eve tries to answer her best, and then he gets a little bit more bold. That's, you're not going to die. And then he twists it and makes God look bad. God wants to hold something back for you because God knows. God knows that if you eat that fruit, then you're going to be like him. The irony is dripping all over this. If you don't know the story, Satan was kicked out of heaven. His rebellion wasn't that he wanted to be God. He wanted to take God's place. And now he's twisting it. And you eat that, you're going to be like God. And God doesn't want that. And I'm like, yeah. You don't like it. In our day, it's not really that big of a deal if you live together before you get married. I mean, try before you buy, right? It's not really that big of a deal to be a little rough with your wife. I mean, you've got to put her in her place. You've got to show her who's boss. It's, it's not that big of a deal if you, if you just change some things around your taxes so you get a little bit more and you claim the kids that don't really live with you. Because you're going to go about money and nobody's ever going to know. We say things like it's a little white rod. It's, it's a gray area. Th those are the lies that the enemy sneaks in and sows into our life. Or maybe it looks like this. So and so didn't speak to you today. They're just stuck up. The pastor's never been to your house. He doesn't value you. He just wants your money and you to show up and do stuff for him. You see the way your son looked at you? He's up to something. And little voices that they, they just, they just slip in. I, I love earlier this week, a relatively new Christian sent me a message on, on, on Facebook. And they said, I'm battling with this decision. And I can't tell which voice is God's and which voice is me or the world or whatever else is going on. I hear these competing things in my head. What trips us up a lot is we get in that place and we listen to the wrong voice. We listen to the one who says, did God really say, instead of the one that says, trust me, I love you. And we can't tell the difference sometimes because going back to how we started... We're not setting aside that time to be with God so we can recognize his voice. And we're naive to the enemy, so we definitely don't recognize his voice. And so we set ourselves up to not know who's who and what voice to listen to and which way to go. Dying to self is that I set aside the time to know the voice of my father. Dying to self is I do the hard things when God calls me to. Because I expect to sacrifice for him. Dying to self is loving others who are difficult to love. And it just goes on and on and on. It is hard. But as I get ready to wrap things up with you, I want you to, to think of that beginning phrase from verse 11. They triumphed, or in some ver versions it says they overcame. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they weren't afraid to die. These things that we've talked about today, even though they're hard things, that's, that's how we win through Him. And so, do, do, do you want to have peace in your home? Win that battle by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, and not being afraid to die to self. 
You want peace in the relationship? Same formula. You want to see this community change for God? Same formula. You want to see our church get past growth barriers and explode and do amazing things for God? Same formula. So I want to ask you guys to consider just doing a, a couple of really simple things today. Yeah, sorry, I, I normally would have this memorized, but we lost an hour last night, right? It's been rough. Surprise me in the first service, it, like older crowd, right? They go to bed at like six o'clock anyway. I don't, I don't know how they even notice losing time. Love you guys if you happen to be watching. Um, some of them watch this service after they go home, so I have to remember that. Sorry, love you, Linda. So. I'm a little foggy, and so that's why uh, I'm having trouble holding on to this. But here's what I want you to think about this morning. First and foremost, have you been washed by God? It's that old song that we used to sing. Are you washed by the blood? The soul that's in blood of me. It's hard to do over whatever he's playing, but you get the picture. Have you started with that relationship with God? That's what he's called us to, by the way. It's, it's a relationship. All of this stuff that we're seeing unfolding, it's not just, it, it's not an angry God pouring out his wrath. It, in reality, it's a God fighting for his holiness and a relationship with us. Have you leaned into that? Have you called him to be your own? That's the first step. Second is this, and this is where it gets hard. There's somebody you need to forgive. There's some area of bitterness tucked in the recesses of the dark places of your heart that you need to let go of. Because that will hinder everything else in your life. I know because I've been there. I've fallen on my face and fallen on my face and fallen on my face and finally opened my eyes to the fact that I'm not moving forward spiritually. I'm not moving forward in my relationship. I'm not moving forward in my job. I'm not moving forward in, 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 in ministry because there's this hurt that I'm not letting go of. Salvation is the gospel is God loved me let that flow through me to others. And here's the thing about carrying old hurts and pains, and sometimes we say, go to that person and, and make it right. But I'm not, I'm not trying to dispute with God's word, but, but, but there is a point to where that can also be hurtful. Especially in the way you present yourself. And I, I don't want you to hear from me that you need to go to someone and say, you're being a jerk, but I forgive you. It's not going to help. I promise you. You might should seek some some advice before you step into that arena. We are called to clear things up with people, but we do it well. But it can start with just in our hearts saying, I've been loved. I've been forgiven. Therefore, I forgive. Let me go. Last question I have for you is, are you all in for the kingdom? Like, is your life about furthering him. It doesn't mean you can't have goals. It doesn't mean you can't have dreams and desires. But are those dreams and desires and goals formed by your love for him and your pursuit of him or just the things you want to do in life? I think you guys have answered that at least in one thing because on the worst Sunday of the year, you got up and came to worship even though you're like dragging and dog tired and it took 15 cups of coffee to get here. Like, like that's the kind of self-sacrifice I'm talking about that you would be fuzzy-headed and tired and probably fighting to focus because you just want to sleep or eat or something. That's what I mean. Are we, are we that all in for the kingdom? Are we so all in that we would speak to that person that needs to hear his story. With that all in, then we would follow God to the next step of what he's calling. We would set aside 20 days to seek his face and to pray hard. That we would invite someone to his service. That we would listen as someone cries and bears their heart and not judge and not try to fix it, but just mourn with them as they mourn. I want to call you into that this morning. And so... As we get ready to sing the last song, I want you to take at least a good, uncomfortable 30 seconds with me. And let's just pray. Let's just talk to him. Let the 
dark places, God, in my heart that I need to deal with? What are the tendencies in my heart where I unleash my fury on the wrong enemy? What are the times, Father, where I'm bound up in my sin, bound up in myself? I know it's going to be painful for us, Father, to confront those places, but we want you to show us today. Help us to be as bold and as full as you of you as that pastor was to forgive and to invite into fellowship the people who had hurt him the most deeply. And help us to see that that is an opportunity to show your love, that those difficult people need to see that in us. And we may never see them respond, and that's okay. Because you've just called us to be faithful and not to worry about the results. Show us, Father, now. I'm going to give us it's those 30 seconds to be quiet before you. And I pray that your spirit would speak clearly. I pray that your spirit would speak loudly. And I pray that you would give us the courage to follow you.